Well, good morning. Hey, thank you everybody for coming out to church. It's great to have you here. If I haven't met you, I'm glad you're here anyway. It's good to have you. Our goal is that everyone, every one of us experience God's incredible love that he has for us. I want to welcome everybody who's watching us online. It's great to have you join us as well uh, via online technology. It's great that you can join us. Uh, we are continuing our series of Radical. And just thinking about that term, some of you love to be radical, and some of you don't like to be radical, you like to be more quiet, whatever, but I just want you to think about this, this just the word radical, you know, as you think about uh, radical, have you ever, think about, you know, in the past, has anybody ever called you radical? Or has anybody ever said to you, you do what? Kind of like that. Like what you do, because I think most of us, not all of us, most of us do some things in our life that seem a little extreme or a little outside the box or a little excessive to other people. It could be our hobbies. Some of us do our hobbies in a way that you golf how many times a week? What? That's that's ridiculous. I mean, that's out there. Like, how can you do that? You know, like if golfing is your thing or whatever kind of our hobby might be, some people might look at you and say, you do what? You do that? Like, that's extreme. That's out there. A little radical, don't you think? And I think we all can tend to do that stuff with our, with our lives. And we do things, you know, maybe more than other people do, whatever it might be. I think, you know, so, some of us, and it could be good things, bad things, whatever, whatever it is. You know, some of us, it might be w- with our kids, you know, and maybe somebody said to you, I know I've said this to people. I have, I don't mean to be critical or judgmental, but I've said this to my younger brother, who's uh, younger than me, not Chad, but Tom. And he has, uh, he had three kids and every one of them were in three sports. And I said, you do what? You drive these kids. They, him and her couldn't even drive the kids to all the sporting events. They had to have grandpa and grandma help, you know, drive. Like, what? That's nuts. You know, that's just, that's just radical. That's out there. It's extreme. You know, you need to pull it back a little bit, you know. But that, that's what he did. Some of us, it could be your exercise. Routine. Some of you are crazy how you exercise. I think it's nuts, okay? But uh, a little exercise is good. But sometimes we can be extreme. But here's the, here's the point. People look at us sometimes as radical because... They don't have the same values we do. We might value something differently, have an experience differently, that, that, you know, we might enjoy things differently. We have different things, different experiences in our life than other people. We're not all the same. And so if somebody doesn't value the same things you value, if, you know, I I personally, uh, I don't go fishing, you know, I don't, I don't fish. So when I look at somebody who goes fishing like constantly, I don't have the same like, I don't have the same value, I don't have the same experience. So to me, that might seem extreme. It kind of depends sometimes on what our experiences are, what what we value, where we've been, what we've went through in our life that can dictate or determine how radical we're going to be in a certain area of our life. I uh, I was just contemplating uh, the Wetterling family. Can you imagine having your 11-year-old son kidnapped? I mean, imagine how that would change your life. Because most of us are aware that the Wetterling family dedicated the next 30 years of their life trying to find their son, trying to change laws, trying to... They, they altered their whole life to the direction of what they experienced by their 11-year-old son being kidnapped. And some of us would say, wow, that may just turn your life. But you know what? We didn't experience that. If you experienced that, if that's what you went through in life, you would most likely alter what you're normally doing. You would alter, you would dedicate your life to something bigger than what you were doing before, because that is extreme. That is, I can't even imagine, matter of fact, just thinking about it during worship, my, my heart just went out. Like, I can't even imagine having an 11, 11 year old son kidnapped and never found again and found out that he was murdered. That changed their whole life. They became radical, extreme about something very, very important in their life. And that is the same way that it was with the very early followers of Jesus. Last week, we kind of talked about it. The early followers of Jesus Christ radically changed their lives. 
Some of them went from fishing or their jobs, whatever they're doing. They absolutely quit everything. They radically became followers of Jesus Christ, changed everything in their life. And as a matter of fact, it didn't matter how much persecution they went through. It didn't matter how much troubles and trials and difficulties and struggles and how tired or hungry or, 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 you know, just cold and all of the things, the extreme things they had to go through. It didn't matter. They were radical about this, this Jesus because it had changed everything. And even when they were threatened to be killed, they did not stop. And we read this last week, and I just want to be reminded of of what their attitude was and how radical they were for Jesus. Uh, Then they were in prison. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. I mean, that was pretty strict. And, you know, you cannot do this anymore. We will take further action. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judge. Listen, I, I know this seems radical to you, whatever, whatever you're at. That, that's where you're at. You judge whether what you think we should do or not. But let me tell you this. As for us, okay, we, for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. There is no threat. There, there is no difficulty. There is no struggle. There is no cost too big that we are going to stop speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. What happened in their lives was these early followers, these disciples of Jesus, they knew who Jesus was and they knew what Jesus did. And that radically changed their life. It radically changed everything because they knew Jesus was the son of God came to this world to give himself up as a ransom for all of the guilty, for mankind, so that we could know God. And that experience, that value, absolutely transformed and changed their life so that they were radical about Jesus Christ. And here's something that we just, that, this, is just this is just a fact. This is just the way it is. Now, There are different levels, but this is what followers of Jesus Christ are like. As a matter of fact, I I believe this, that followers of Jesus live differently than others. Followers of Jesus are radical compared to others, compared to those who aren't followers of Jesus. It can be believers in God. It can even be believers in Jesus Christ. But followers of Jesus live different. Do you live different than your neighbors? Even when I say that, I, we need to kind of discern different. Doesn't, it doesn't mean that you can't have a tattoo, okay? Okay. Doesn't I have one? You see that? It doesn't mean you can't ride motorcycles. Doesn't mean you can't have a fast car. Of course, you shouldn't speed, but you do, like everybody else. It it doesn't mean that you can't have a job, a family. When I say followers of Jesus live different than people who aren't, it's not all of that visual surfacey stuff. There is something deeper than that stuff. Followers of Jesus and not followers of Jesus, everybody else, there are so many similarities that sometimes you can't tell the difference just by looking at them. But if you do life with them, you will see a difference. And I know that, you know, in this culture, we don't even know our neighbors, but but the people that you work with, the people that your, your extended family, people around you, if you are a follower of Jesus, your life will look different than theirs. Because followers of Jesus, it's it's values. That a follower of Jesus has a different perspective than others. Followers of Jesus have an eternal perspective. Followers of Jesus value life differently. Followers of Jesus live by a set of rules that other people don't live by. 
that followers of Jesus, they, they do things that are radical in the eyes of people who aren't followers of Jesus. Followers of Jesus, nobody's perfect, not even close. This has nothing to do with that. But followers of Jesus are, are drawn to love people who are their enemies. Follower, that's, that's radical. That's, that's nuts. That's, that's crazy to people who aren't followers of Jesus. Followers of Jesus forgive people who have used them and abused them and deliberately attack them. That's radical. Followers of Jesus do things that are so different than people who don't follow Jesus. It's like followers of Jesus have a different set of, of driving forces on the inside, different set of values, goals. There's mission, there's purpose that others don't have. And we do things that are different. These, these different uh, values of, of people who aren't. And I think the whole thing comes down to this, that followers of Jesus are so different in so many ways than others that other people, if you are a follower of Jesus, other people should look at you sometimes and say, you what? You did what? You forgave them? You bought the boss a Christmas present? I mean, it's just some, some radical things that are just so different. Today, I want to talk about something that is so extremely radical. It is so different than people who aren't followers of Jesus. And it's this. Being a servant. Serving and being a servant makes no sense. It seems illogical. It's against our culture. As a matter of fact, you and I, all of us are affected by our culture all the time. But our culture tells you and I that we don't, we don't have to bow to anybody. We're free. We're our own person. We make up our own rules. We are not bowing to anybody. We are not going to be the servant of anyone. I mean, I'll go to work, you know, and I'll get a paycheck, but by golly, if they don't respect me or pay me enough or treat me that way, you know, forget them. I am, I am bowing to nobody. I'm not submitting myself to anybody else's rules if I don't agree with it. Because our culture tells us that being a servant is lower. It is degrading. It is lesser of a person. Like, you're your own person. You do your own thing. You got your own rights. But followers of Jesus... Our servants, and especially servants of Jesus. Followers of Jesus serve Jesus voluntarily. That means that followers humble themselves. It's not about my rules. It's not about what I want to do. I serve somebody bigger than me. I'm a servant of Jesus. I bow to his authority. I bow to his plans. I do what he wants to do, and I serve him, and I become a servant. And especially to serve Jesus in his mission. There's something that I think I find very interesting, and I don't mean to be, I mean, never, never do, do I mean to be like critical or condemning in any way. But I oftentimes run into and, and have been there myself, but uh, Christian people, people who believe in Jesus Christ, but, but don't go to church, don't, uh, don't fellowship with anybody, they're kind of on their own, you know. And when I, when I run into them, some of them used to come to church here, and it's just awkward running into them in the grocery store, you know. Yeah, well, how are you doing? And here's what they, they always assure me of this. Maybe it's some of you, I don't know. So, always assure me of this. Oh, yeah, no, we don't go to church or anything, but trust me, we're close to God. We're close to God. I always feel this way. And there's levels of closeness, but if you're close to God, wouldn't you care about the things that God cares about? I mean, if you're close to God, then wouldn't you... Wouldn't you engage in the things that God engages in? 
Wouldn't you want to value the things that God values? And, and so oftentimes in Christianity, and if you've been around church at all, or at all you've heard what to do, you know, hey, you know what not to do, don't sin, don't do this, don't do that, don't do that. And I think sometimes, sometimes we think that not drinking or smoking or you know, swearing and stuff like that is, is serving God. Now, I'll give you, there's, there's a little bit of obeying God. I think God wants us to do that stuff. But in the servanthood I'm talking about today, this, this servant thing isn't just like I'm living a Christian-looking life. I, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't chew, I don't go with girls who do, unless they're really good looking. But anyway, uh, that was totally inappropriate, wasn't it? Totally. Anyway, uh, I lost my train of thought. Anyway, uh, I think sometimes we think like we're satisfying God, we're close to God if we just live, you know, I I pray, I read my Bible, I don't sin, you know, I forgive people, I love people, but there's a missing element there, and that is serving his purpose. God has a purpose for you and I, and it's not just our personal holiness, It's not like, you know, God wants us to do things because it's really good for us. He loves us. He wants us to not hurt ourselves, and he wants us to love people. I got that. But there's something bigger than all of that. It's not like you trade one for the other, but there's something that's so important. It's a driving thing that if you, if you care, if you're close to God, you'd care about the things that God cares about. And God cares about his mission in this world. And a servant, a follower of Jesus Christ, is a servant to the mission. A servant to where God's heart is. When Jesus was was here, and uh, you've heard this statement, the, the, the Great Commission, what Jesus gave the final command or directive to his followers, he said this, and then he told them, Go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. This is his mission. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, this commission, this command, this directive is directly to you. Go and preach the good news to everyone. Go and spread the gospel. Go be a servant to this mission, that this mission is a driving force. It's almost like the Wetterling family when something so big happened in their life, so big, it directed the rest of their life. They became radical in a mission that was more important than other things in their life. And as a follower of Jesus, this command is more important than so many other things in our, in our lives. And as a follower of Jesus, we are servants to this mission that God, that Jesus Christ is all about. Go and preach the good news. Why? Because it's the whole reason he came. It's all about God's love. This is the story of humanity. There is nothing more important in this world than the gospel, the good news about Jesus Christ. Nothing more important. And Jesus said, I am entrusting that to my followers. My followers, I am entrusting you to be about this mission because it's the most important thing. There is is nothing greater. There is nothing more important. There is nothing more valuable, nothing more precious, nothing more eternal than the mission of spreading the gospel throughout the world because it comes down to this. It really does. And this this is where it hits home. Jesus said, that he is the only way to the Father. Every person you know, could be your parents, your children, your siblings, your friends, your coworkers, everyone you know, everyone in the world, Jesus is the only way to eternal life. That there is an eternity after this very short life is over. And anyone who does not know Jesus Christ will spend eternity away from God in a hopeless hell. That's reality. And God loved the world so much that he gave his son 
so that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but they would have everlasting life in his name, in the name of Jesus. And Jesus finished his work of salvation, and now he says to my followers, here's what you need to be about, spreading this message around the world, spreading this message in every way that you can. How did the, how did the early church do it? I, I love how the apostle Paul, uh, I mean, this, this message, this mission, he was such a servant to this mission. Listen to what he says about his own life in, in this servanthood to this mission. He says this, though I am free, I mean, Paul was free, you and I are free, though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave or a servant to everyone. Why would I do that? Because I get something out of it? Because it makes me famous? Because, you know, there's something for me? No. I make myself a servant to everyone for this reason. To win as many as possible. To the Jews, I become like a Jew. To win the Jews. To those under the law, I become like one under the law. Though I myself am not under the law, I'm not. But I submit and become a servant to this. Why? So as to win those under the law. He goes on, he says, to those not having the law, I become like one not having the law. Though I am not free from God's law. Listen, I'm not a lawless, but I'm under Christ's law. Why do I act? Why do I live? Why do I become like one not under the law? So as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I become weak. I am a servant to this mission and not to myself. I am not weak, but I will become weak because it's not about me. It's not about what I want to do. It's not about praise to me. It is because I have become a servant to the mission of Jesus Christ, which causes me to submit myself to every possible way. Why? To win the weak is why I do it. It's all about drawing people into a knowledge of Jesus Christ, into a growing relationship with God. He goes on and he says, I do all this, I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. I become a servant to the mission of Jesus Christ. Why? To win those that are far from God. Because there is nothing more important. There is nothing greater. It's not about me. It's about every single person that I can win. And here's what's really interesting about submitting to this mission. Submitting to this mission is something that we don't do by ourselves. My dad has always said for years and years, there are no lone rangers in the mission. There are no lone rangers. It's not just what you can do by yourself. Submitting to this mission means gathering together. It means doing it as a, the church the ecclesia, the called out ones of God for a purpose. And that is to win the world, to draw the world. And we do that as a group, as a family of God. We work together, we commit to one another, and we submit to this mission. Together we submit to this mission so we can accomplish something. There's, there's parts of scripture we, you've probably never studied. We've probably never shown this next scripture on the, on the screen. It seems very, very unimportant. I don't know why it's in there, except for I'm going to use it today. But at the end of many, many, most of Paul's letters, at the end of them, he oftentimes says, hey, greet so-and-so and thank so-and-so. And we, we, that doesn't make good Bible study material. But there's something in there that just is so evident that Paul never did this on his own. Paul was not a lone ranger. He was sent out. He was accompanied. They worked together. Other churches sponsored. They were together in this. And at the end of Romans, he spends a lot of time, a lot of time saying, hey, greet so-and-so there in Rome and greet so-and-so. And oh man, they were a worker with me and they helped me in the ministry and they were involved. And they gave themselves to this. And then after that, he says from the people, he says, Timothy, my co-worker, sends his greetings. My co-worker that this mission, I, I am a servant to this mission with 
everybody else with Timothy. I'm not on my own. And he sends his greetings to you. So does Lucius and Jason and, I mean, I call him John, I don't know. My fellow Jews, I, Tertius, don't ever name your children Tertius. Don't do that. It's not, that's not fair. I, and listen, I, who wrote down this letter? Listen, you, you don't realize this, but what a servant in the mission. This guy right here was, was writing down what Paul was dictating. Paul did not write, physically write the letter to the Romans. Paul told somebody else what to write. It's a team. They did it together. They were involved in this thing, and so many people working together for this. He wrote this letter down. He greet you in the Lord. Uh, Gaius, Gaius, whose hospitality I and the whole church here enjoy, sends you his greetings. Erastus, who is the city's director in public, of public works, and our brother, uh, oh, what, Quartus? send you their greetings. My, my point is all this. There's two points to this. They, they had terrible names back then. Second point, <laughs> the second point is we do this together. Followers of Jesus Christ are servants to Jesus in his mission. Servants to Jesus' mission, to what it's about. Not just our own personal holiness and how we live as a Christian. No, we step into a servant to this mission. How does that look today? How does this serving the mission look today? I'll tell you this, it's radical. It looks different than the people you work with who aren't followers of Jesus. It looks different than your brothers and sisters who aren't. It looks different than your neighbors. It looks different. And I, I like how the Bible kind of tells us um, what this is all about for today, for you and I. He says, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers. He gave these to the church. Why? Why? There's a purpose here. To equip his people for works of service. Why? So that the body of Christ may be built up. This is God's plan. This is God's desire. This is his command for followers of Jesus to become servants to his mission and what he's called the church to do. That every single one of us would be equipped to work together. Later on, he says this. He says, as each part is doing its work, it makes for bodily growth. I've often felt like um, so many times, um, you know, we, we tend to want to be lone rangers sometimes. We just do. And I think sometimes, well, I'll just do my Christian thing on my own or, or you know, by myself. And we kind of want to do that. But the, the point of it is this, that it's only when we work together do we really accomplish anything. It's working together is God's point. It's working together. The, the greatest evangelistic tool in our world is ecclesia, the church. You and I, the called out ones coming together, each one doing our part in reaching this world. There are so many good things that you, can be, you and I can be a part of, and we should. There are a lot of good things, good humanitarian things that we can be a part of. You know, I, I think that uh, getting, raising food shelf money is a great thing to do. You know, I think helping those less fortunate is a great thing. There's so many great things to do, but every one of them, every one of them should be second. The most important thing you and I can do is work together in the church, not this one, a church. Work together in a church with the specific mission of drawing people into a growing relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That is the number one call, the number one mission of followers of Jesus Christ. After we are doing that, we can do other things. So what does it look like in this church? Really quick, I'm just going to go over a few things. Uh, I always figure that if you want to do something for God, be a greeter at a local church. No, I want to go out there and like, 
hand out Bibles. And so, that's cool after you're a greeter at a church. In our culture today, this might change. The greatest way to be a part of the mission is to be a part of a local church, any local church, just a local church. I often wonder of all the Christians, the followers of Jesus, and you and I know many of them, that don't help, don't do nothing for the kingdom of God. They're great Christians, but they do nothing for the mission. I often wonder, what would happen if every Christian in this community or in this nation or in the world would engage in the mission. Do you know how different America would look if every believer in Jesus Christ engaged in the mission? This would be a different world. It would be a different world. If you want to do something great for God, be a greeter at a local church. The local church is where the bulwark of truth comes from in our, in, in our world today. And uh, I just want to quickly go over some things. Sometimes things don't seem so spiritual, but they are a part. As each part does their thing, it makes for bodily growth. And, and I think sometimes there, there's a couple of people, and they don't want to be named, and I, I appreciate that. I would love to plaster them up on the, on the big screen and you to see them because they're amazing servants to the mission. There are two people in particular that probably put in I don't know, they come in three, three or four days a week. They clean this whole church. Look around. I mean, this whole church. You ever, you ever walk in? You walk in. You know what? You never noticed how clean it was because you only noticed dirty. When you walk out, just look how beautiful this building is. It's a beautiful building. It's so clean. Everything's amazing. Two volunteers do that. I mean, mainly there's others that help, but mainly two people make that happen. And you know what? When they're in here vacuuming, and scrubbing out your urine. Okay, that might have been too much. Uh, emptying your garbage. You know what they're doing? They are engaging in the mission of Jesus Christ to make followers around the world. They are in direct proportion in ministry to that. The greeters at the front door. Do you know they all work together? Everybody works together. This is a clean place. The parking lot's clean. The, the snow is kind of removed most of the winter. But, you know, all this stuff matters. It all matters and it all makes ministry. Hey, ministering to the kids. The local church, I'm trying to go fast now. The local church is a place where you and I can plug in, do our part to build the kingdom of God because we are servants of Him. It's radical. I sometimes watch what the band does. They, they come in. They practice at home. They come in on Thursday night, do a complete run-through of every song. They're here before anybody ever. They unlock the doors and come in here in the morning, you know, two hours before the service starts. And they go everything over everything again. And then they do this. And they don't get paid for it. Why do they do this? It's all about the mission. It's about I am one part of everybody working together to spread the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And there's a place for every one of us to be a servant. There are things in the local church from outside lawn care to cleaning the building to production to running the lights to helping set things up move tables teaching kids doing adult bible studies opening up your homes for small groups i mean there's just there's just so many things that when you and i become servants to god's mission then we humble ourselves and we serve for this mission and that's what God's plan is, and that's what God uses to fulfill his great commission in this world. To go into all the world, preach the gospel, make disciples of all people. That's what God has asked his followers to do. Are you involved? You can be involved. You can be involved. Go online, find out a place. Where do I fit? What can I do best? Can I teach a Bible study? Can I vacuum the carpet? Can I help with kids? Can I be involved in recovery? I have some experience there. Can, can I be, there's so many things to do. 
with that, let's pray. Father, I feel so many times that we, uh, myself included, we just as humans, we have good ideas and we don't act on it. There's so many times. Father, it's radical. I'm not even going to tell my friends that I serve at a church. But Lord, I know that's what you want us to do. You have commanded us. You've made it clear that I am trusting you to serve in this mission of spreading the gospel together with everyone else, together as a body making a difference in this world. Help each one of us, Father. Encourage each one of us to step out of our comfort zone, to step forward and say, here am I, use me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.